اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الخلق اجمعین سیدنا و حبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم المصطفی محمد اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم وعلى اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین قال اللہ تعالی فی محکم کتابه الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ادعو الى سبیل ربك بالحکمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم باللتی هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبیله وهو اعلم بالمهتدین God states in the Holy Quran in chapter 16 verse 125 in the name of God most gracious most merciful call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good exhortation and dispute with them in the most virtuous manner. Amanna billah sadaqallahu al-aliyu al-azim. Let us enliven our hearts and minds in our gathering with the remembrance of the Holy Prophet and his purified progeny. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. A while back, a young man approached me and he said, Sayyid, I want to ask you a question. I said, go ahead. He said, Sayyid, why are religious people so judgmental? So I was taken aback. I wasn't expecting, you know, this kind of question. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I know a lot of people who are religiously observant. And I've experienced many cases where they've tried to teach me or give me advice but in doing so they've been very judgmental they are often very condescending when they try to correct you know my behavior or try to teach me what is right very judgmental sometimes borderline kind of obnoxious right and you all probably can think of Times where you may have experienced people who come off as quite judgmental. And this is especially problematic when the person is religiously observant. Right? So this young man was asking me, Sayyid, why are religious people judgmental? And I tried to find an answer. And I gave him an answer, but then afterwards... I sat down and, you know, I began to think about this question a little bit more. You know, what is, what is the reason? Why could it be that sometimes we find, of course, we don't want to generalize, obviously, we don't generalize, but why is it that sometimes some who are religiously observant can come off as being judgmental or condescending towards others? And I thought that perhaps one reason is that at least when we talk about the Islamic tradition, we find that there is a great deal of emphasis on giving and offering advice to others. The Quran, for instance, talks about the believing men and the believing women. God says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ That the believing men and the believing women are guardians, they're protectors of one another, it's reciprocal. And the Qur'an gives one feature of, you know, this act of guarding and protecting, one characteristic of the believing men and believing women is that يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ they enjoin good, they encourage good, al-amr bil ma'roof, and they discourage or prohibit evil, wa nahyu anil munkar. And we know that there are many other verses in the Quran, many traditions by the Holy Prophet and his purified progeny, the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam, about the importance of what? Of enjoining good, of encouraging people to do that which is right. And similarly, of discouraging them from doing something that is wrong. Many, many reports. And we know that, for instance, in some of the famous reports, 
they suggest that al-amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi 'anil munkar enjoining good and forbidding wrong there are several stages right there are several expressions sometimes it's done through speech sometimes it's done through action so the verses and the traditions that emphasize encouraging good right there's a, there are many many other traditions by the prophet and his purified progeny that remind us that we have a responsibility towards others and that we should offer advice to others for instance the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam says this was certainly a post iftar salawat right so let's repeat the salawat inshallah with a little bit more energy He says, "Inna a'adam al-nasi manzilatan 'inda Allah yawm al-qiyamati amshahum fi ardhihi bin nasihati li khalqi." The Prophet says that among the greatest of God's creation, those who are greatest in the sight of God on the day of judgment, are those who spend much of their time and energy offering advice to God's creation. They spend time and energy offering advice. And there are many, many other reports. So perhaps it may be because of this insistence that we have, this encouragement that the Quran and the prophetic teachings and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, these teachings emphasize and encourage us to get, give advice and to try to help to guide people towards that which is good and discourage them from that which is bad, it may be that sometimes some people take this to an extreme. And so they may end up in attempting to give advice, to offer advice, to guide, to help. They may come off as condescending sometimes or as judgmental. But this is a problem because the Quran and the prophetic teachings they don't just encourage us to teach others. They also encourage us to be aware of how we teach others. Of how we approach advice. Of how we approach calling to God. The Quran is very clear. Call to the way of your Lord with al hikmah wisdom. Good advice, good exhortation. What does it mean to exhort people positively? Call people in a positive manner to the way of your Lord. So what can we do if this is a problem that we face? Sometimes we find that we may also face this problem ourselves. In our interactions with our spouse, with our children, with our siblings, with friends, with strangers, right? Sometimes, you know, out of this desire to help people, to guide people, to give them advice, sometimes we may come off as being judgmental. Sometimes, you know, God forbid, we may be condescending. So if this is a problem that I face, what can I do in order to avoid God forbid, being judgmental or condescending towards others. There are few things that we can do when it comes to offering positive advice, good advice. Number one is that we should always recognize that not all who are quote-unquote religious today were religious yesterday. And similarly, not all who are quote-unquote religious today will remain religious tomorrow. In other words, this idea of religiosity, being observant, doing what you're supposed to do, avoiding those things that you're not supposed to do, keeping yourself firm in your faith and belief, this is not something that is necessarily stable. It's an ongoing journey. It's an ongoing battle. And history gives us many examples of people who started off in darkness and then came to light. They started off, they spent 
substantial portions of their lives in wrong, in doing wrong, in disbelief. But then God instilled the light of guidance in their hearts and they turned towards goodness. Many examples. You know, we, for instance, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, we have many examples of this, but a key and popular, famous example of this is Al-Hurr bin Yazid al-Riyahi. Someone that we're all familiar with, right? Al-Hurr is a commander of the Umayyad army, the one who is in charge of intercepting Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his family and taking them from Kufa before they arrived to Kufa to Karbala, right? He had, he was a commander, he was a general in the army. And he comes on the day of Ashura, according to the reports, he comes forward to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he seeks forgiveness. Right? So this is an example and he fights alongside Imam Hussein and he ends up gaining martyrdom alongside Imam Hussein. This is an example, a prominent example of someone who may have lived a substantial part of their lives or at least, at least, they made some major wrong decisions, right? And then ended up on the path of truth, on the path of guidance. Similarly, there are other examples of, you know, the other way around. The Qur'an, for instance, gives us an example indirectly of a man by the name of Barsisa, also famous. It's a prominent incident, right? A man from the Israelites, Bani Israel, Barsisa, who the traditions, they tell us, he was a well-known worshipper. He spent all of his life or most of his life in worship, in belief, and then what ends up happening? The traditions, they tell us that Iblis, Satan, Shaitan, he ends up misguiding him slowly but surely. He spent his entire life in worship, in devotion, right? But he ended up slowly being misguided to the point where his end was a destructive end. He engaged in major acts of immorality. Satan was able to get to him. He wasn't able to maintain the consistency of his faith. And Satan is very creative, dear friends. Very creative in the way that he approaches us. He doesn't approach us in ways in which we may be confident about ourselves. He knows where our weak points are and he approaches us through those weak channels. They say that... A man one day um, fell asleep and he saw in his dream that he met Iblis, he met Satan. And so he figured since he's meeting Iblis, he should ask him some questions. So he asked, he said to Iblis, he said, listen, you know, you've been very successful in misguiding countless people across history. So I just want to ask you, how do you do it? How do you misguide people? What are some of your tactics? So at least Satan began to explain to him. He said, you know, I have many tools. So he began to show him sort of his garage with all of his tools, right? Said, you know, for some people, for instance, those who have very strong faith, I have to use this huge anchor to wrap around them and, you know, really pull them with this huge anchor. For others, no, you know, I have this big rope that I use. They have a little bit less faith. They're a little bit easier. So I use this big rope. I tie it around them and I, and I pull them. For others, you know, I have another tool, this string, for instance, or this smaller rope or this string, right? Those who are a little bit easier for me to pull, to draw. And so I use these various tactics and these various tools to pull people towards me. So the man was very interested. He said, you know, this is fascinating. I have one more question that I'd like to ask you. What tool do you use with me? He said, you? Oh, you? I just do this and you come running to me. <laughs> Shaitan is creative, right? He comes to us in various ways in order to draw us away from the truth, in order to 
uh, put us off the path of righteousness. So it's important for us to remember that the journey of faith and belief and iman and goodness and righteousness is a daily journey. It's a daily battle that we fight. And this is why we always should pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He has given us iman and goodness, that He continues to guide us. Allahumma ja'al awaqiba umurina khayra. My Lord, allow me to persist in this faith, in this goodness. Until the end. And so it's important for us to remember that when I am trying to teach others, to give them advice, if I think that they have made a mistake, they've done something wrong, right? I should not be condescending or judgmental. Perhaps it is that God will guide this person one day. And perhaps it is that God forbid I may slip one day. I may not be able to endure one day. And it's only through the mercy of God that we find guidance. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadanullah. Praise and gratitude be to God who has guided us to this. Had God not guided us, we would not have found guidance. We can't do it alone. We need God's mercy. So it's important for me to remember that it is through God's mercy and kindness and compassion that we find the truth and that we hold on to the truth and that we should not take faith for granted and guidance for granted. This is one thing that we can keep in mind. Another thing that we keep in mind, which is related, and that is the importance of remembering our own sins and shortcomings. Sometimes in the quest to point out the faults of others, sometimes we get so preoccupied that we forget about our own faults. We forget that we've also made mistakes. We forget that we need to pay attention to some of our own shortcomings. And so, as quickly as we are to point out the faults of others, we're also quick to forget our own faults and, and mistakes. And unfortunately, we find that some people, they go even further. Some people go on fault-finding missions. It's like an adventure. They try to go around and find people's faults. Not just to point them out. To go and to actually find, let me see what, you know, what record I can come up with. Find people's mistakes, find some of their faults, their misdeeds, things that are you know, wrong in their lives. Actively to do that, unfortunately. And the Quran tells us to, in much more beautiful ways, to mind our business. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْ يُهُوا بَلِيبُ اجْتَنِبُوا كَثِيرًا مِنَ الظَّنِّ إِنَّ بَعْضَ الظَّنِّ إِذْ Avoid much conjecture, suspicion. Because some of it is what? Some of it is wrong. Some of it is immoral. Some conjecture and suspicion that we have is sin. So the Qur'an is telling us avoid most of it. Don't go looking for people's faults. Instead of looking for people's faults and trying to correct people's faults, we should also work on correcting our own faults. Now, of course, does that mean that I should never give people advice until I become perfect? No, we will never become perfect. None of us will become perfect, right? But that does not mean, what it also means is that I should not dedicate my time and effort only to attempting to correct other people's wrongs and then God forbid forget about my own shortcomings. We should spend some time ref re reflecting on and rectifying our own faults and our own shortcomings. And then finally, it's important for us to remember that being judgmental, in some ways it stems from a sense of arrogance. Right? You are kind of taking up the role of God because God is Al-Hakim or Al-Hakim. 
God is the ultimate judge. When we judge others, what we see is only apparent. We don't necessarily see what is in people's hearts, what is in their minds. We only see that which is apparent. Whereas God sees the apparent and what? And the hidden. God sees us not just based on our physical appearances, our outside appearances and our actions, but also based on our hearts and our intentions, what we intend. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes, sometimes the intention is much more profound and much more important than the act. Intention gives value. It gives flavor to our actions. This is why the hadith says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Because sometimes you can do an act, right? Apparently it's a good act. But if your intention is a bad intention, it becomes worthless. And sometimes the act could be a small act. It's not grand, right? It's not, you know, game changing. But the intention behind it is a good intention. It's a pure intention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala magnifies this act. Sometimes it may be that a person is trying. They're trying their best. Their heart is in the right place. Their heart is in the right place. They want to make good choices. They want to do the right thing. They want to be on the path of guidance. But they're slipping. They're going through things in their lives which are making it much more of a challenge. We don't necessarily see people's hearts and intentions, but God does. So when I act in a judgmental fashion, this stems from a sense of arrogance, as though I can see not just that which is apparent, but what is in people's hearts. I kind of play the role of God. And arrogance, arrogance is a great spiritual disease, dear friends. It's a great spiritual disease. It's what God... Satan kicked out of paradise in the first place. God, according to the Islamic tradition, he created Adam and he asked the angels or the inhabitants of the heavens, the angels and some jinn, Satan is among the jinn, to prostrate before Adam. They all did except Iblis. We all know the story. God asks him, he says, why? مَا مَنَعَكَ أَلَّا تَسْجُدَ إِذْ أَمَرْتُكَ And what was his reply? His reply was, I did not obey you, my Lord. I did not prostrate before Adam because I am better than he is. I'm better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. So what is the superior one doing prostrating before the inferior one? And so God says what? God says, for this you leave. If you think about it a little bit, think about this you know, if we closely read the verses surrounding this. What Iblis did, what Satan did was an act of disobedience. God told him prostrate. He said, no, I'm not going to prostrate. But you don't necessarily find God reprimanding Satan for not prostrating. What does he reprimand him for? He reprimands him for acting arrogantly, for saying the reason why I did not prostrate is because I'm better than him. Then God tells him, now you leave. Because this place, there is no place for arrogance in this place, in paradise. So he expels him. And so sometimes, you know, ironically what ends up happening is that in our attempt to push others towards paradise, Sometimes we end up banning ourselves from paradise. When we are pushy, when we are judgmental, when we are condescending towards others, even if it's the right intention, right? But if it comes from, God forbid, the sense of arrogance, then we end up barring ourselves, banning ourselves from the place that we're trying to push others towards. Now, it's still important for us to give advice. It's still important for us to teach, to offer advice and to teach. And we know that sometimes what ends up happening is some will avoid offering advice either to their spouse or their children or friends or community members because of the fear of coming off 
as judgmental. Because someone will tell me, if I try to offer advice, they'll tell me, hey, mind your own business. You do you, and I'll do me. Let me do what I need to do, and you can take care of yourself. Don't you have any shortcomings? Didn't you listen to Sayyid's lecture last night? He said, focus on your own shortcomings. Huh? Right? So, the problem, what ends up happening is sometimes we will avoid giving advice because we don't want to come off as judgmental. So what does that mean? Do we just sit back? We don't do anything? Especially to those who are important to us. The Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, Go anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, Take care of yourselves, your families, protect one another, right? We have responsibilities towards others around us. So do I just sit back? I don't give any advice. I don't offer any advice because I'm afraid that it might be taken the wrong way. No, absolutely not. But it's important for me to think about the etiquette of offering advice. And here, this is where our traditions really emphasize on not just what we say, but how we say what we say. Sometimes how we say something is more important or more effective than what we say. And this is why even in the case of Pharaoh, God sends Moses and his brother Aaron to Pharaoh in the Quran. What does he say? فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا Now this is Pharaoh. Do you guys know who Pharaoh is? Pharaoh said, I'm God. Pharaoh would massacre people left and right. He engaged in genocide, to use contemporary terms. He engaged in genocide. He massacred people. He engaged in all sorts of immoral act, corruption. And when God sends Prophet Moses and his brother Aaron, peace be upon them, he says, when you go to him and you speak to him, speak to him in leniency. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا Is he a wrongdoer? Yes, he's a wrongdoer. Is he oppressive? Yes, he is. he's maybe the most oppressive. But when you go to him and when you speak to him, speak to him in a way that is good in a way that is constructive. Because if you turn to him and they say, hey, Pharaoh, you're an oppressor. You're going to hell. If that's the way that you're going to approach him, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? He's going to be repelled. And this is normal, dear friends. We get repelled when someone confronts us. We don't like when people confront us. Even if I know that I've done wrong, if someone confronts me, I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes this ends up pushing us away. It pushes people away. And that's not what you want. So the Quran reminds us that when we turn to others, there is an etiquette to giving advice. Do so in a manner that is constructive. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He says, when it comes to giving advice, he says, لِيَنْصَحِ الرَّجُلْ مِنْكُمْ أَخَاهُ كَنَصِيحَتِهِ لِنَفْسِهِ He says, when you offer advice to others, do so as though you are offering advice to yourself. When I stand in front of the mirror, and I look at myself in the mirror, how do I look at myself? Do I kind of mad dog myself in the mirror? No. I look at myself and I smile, very appreciative. Oh, who's this beautiful young man standing in front of me? Right? Even when I give myself advice, oftentimes, in most cases, when I give myself advice, how do I give myself advice? Do I curse at myself? Right? Do I yell at myself? No. I'm very lenient. Hey, listen, maybe you should have done this this other way. Right? Maybe what you said or what you did, there could have been a better way to do so. I'm very gentle with myself. The Prophet says when you offer advice to others, do so as though you are offering it to yourself in a very gentle way, in a very loving way, caring way. So that's when we offer advice. But there's the other side of the equation, and that is receiving advice. Because often, it is, the discussion is about offering advice to others guiding others, teaching others. Sometimes we find ourselves 
on the receiving end. What do I do when someone comes to me with advice? How do I approach this topic? Here, the ahadith, they also tell us that it's important for us to be receptive. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Tuba liman ata'a nasihan yahdi. He says, glad tidings, good for the one who listens to the one who offers him advice. And the one who does so sincerely. If someone is offering you sincere advice, be accepting. If you've done something wrong and someone comes and says, hey, listen, I care about you. I want what is good for you. And they give you advice or they may offer other types of advice or guidance. Don't be stubborn. Some people are stubborn. They assume that they know every, they're the only person in the world who knows and does everything right. And they say that one of the worst things that you can do is to try to offer advice to someone who is stubborn. Because offering advice to someone who is stub stubborn is like trying to convince you know, a cat to take a bath. It doesn't end well. I don't have a cat, but I've seen cat videos online. And usually it doesn't end well, right? Trying to convince a cat to take a bath. If someone is stubborn, they're persistent in their ways. What does this do? This ends up blocking guidance, blocking opportunities towards learning and growing. So I have to be receptive as well. I don't just go around giving advice to others. I also have to be receptive of other people's advice to me. And especially when that advice insists, is sincere. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during what is left of these blessed days and nights of the holy month of Ramadan to accept our um, prayers, our fasting, our supplications, our good deeds. We ask Allah to honor us with the ziyarah of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in this life and with their shafa and intercession in the hereafter. Dear friends, uh, tonight inshallah the youth uh, will be holding uh, a poetry slam uh, starting uh, in about 45 minutes at 10.30, inshallah. Um, there will be a poetry slam and I think a, a workshop. Uh, so if uh, you are interested, your youth are interested, inshallah, the program will start, inshallah, tonight uh, at uh, 10.30 and you're all encouraged to participate. And this would be a nice way, uh, you know, for the young uh, uh, people in our, gener in our community to come together and to be able to express themselves creatively inshallah allahumma aghfir dhunub al mu'minina wal mu'minat al muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujib al da'awat innaka qadi al hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ila arwah al mu'minina wal mu'minat nuhdi jami'an thawaba surat al fatiha ma as salat ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin الرحمن الرحيم